Today, we're going to have a webinar on the topic of digital workplace performance for work from anywhere productivity. And this is a subject we can all appreciate. Hybrid working is really here to stay. We're going to take a look at the trends. We're going to look at what we experience when we're trying to work from different locations and using different applications. And then we'll show you how to fix those problems by taking a look into the end-to-end -end visibility of the digital experience of your employees. Take a look at where we're at today with the digital workplace. And really, as I mentioned, it's something that's ingrained itself deeply into the new method of working for enterprises globally. So calling up the statistics here from Gartner's most recent report a couple of months ago, three quarters of employees will remain hybrid or remote for the next few years. The trend is not weakening and 82% of companies have productivity anywhere models, and they're doing this to try to attract and retain and engage in employees. Uh, but there's more tangible benefits than just the employees themselves and trying to uh, recruit and uh, engage talent. The top 15% of organizations have achieved more of the digital workplace itself. So the excellence in that space find that they're missing almost half of less deadlines are being missed and also a lot less time being wasted by employees who are more engaged and more focused on uh, tasks and also not waiting for their IT systems and applications to load. This also results in 61% of employees being more productive. This is a very recent study. And we've all seen studies that talk about how we can be more productive at home, but this is not just home we're talking about here. We're talking about hybrid workplaces where people are in the office and at home going back and forth and also using the digital systems that are optimized for performance uh, first. Let's take a look at the technology that the leading enterprises are using to connect users uh, wherever they are. Uh, some of the major trends right now, uh, changing your offices, of course, into a shared spaces, co-working spaces, and also making sure that the home office has the same level of performance as you get at work. Also to support that kind of mobility, getting people into the office a few days a week, going for a Wi-Fi and laptop first kind of IT policy. So no longer even for engineers who need a lot of computing power, do we normally see a desktop computer being issued to them? You're seeing laptop as the new desktop and Wi-Fi instead of RJ45 and Ethernet connections in the office just to allow people to move around, to plug in wherever they want to be, and also uh, learn to trust the Wi-Fi network so they don't have to plug in for those important uh, Microsoft Teams, WebEx calls. It's also important that we're able to take any device we have, uh, whether it's bring your own device or mobile devices and plug in and get work done. So you might be in between transit or on a train on the way to work and you want to be able to have a quick Zoom call or a Teams call or connect to your unified communication platform. So that's really critical that all those run seamlessly over Wi-Fi and over mobile devices. And what we've also seen introduced, and maybe it's not obvious to all the employees, but you're in IT, that this is the way that we're starting to connect people now. So we're moving away more away from VPNs and more towards the SASE or the secure service edge type solutions. Internal SD-WANs bringing you to private uh, destinations. And depending on what we're trying to reach, there's another way to get there or an optimal way to get there. And this is what uh, would be called dual tunneling, where even if you're in a retail store, or you're in an office or a manufacturer, and then you have sites that are connecting into both private applications as well as ones from the internet SaaS applications. You're probably using a different path to get there to, to maintain security, but also performance from those important sites. So obviously cloud migration is one of those big drivers that's brought this along uh, and is pushing this kind of different connectivity, but also just a purely, absolutely, totally miserable experience we have on VPNs is, is really bringing in the SASE market and the, the need to do things differently. So we're seeing this serving a very distributed audience, distributed users, a uh, very diverse set of demands. So you have people working at home or in the office that perform many different roles. So if you're a contact center agent, very different requirements than if you're an accountant. Uh, these are very dynamic roles, but so are the hosting environments. So now you have hosts in SaaS and cloud that are also distributed and highly diverse and interconnected and dynamic. And that changes behavior and the digital experience, especially in this world where we're highly dependent on Wi-Fi, internet, public networks, browser performance, and the machine itself. And the kind of apps we use and the path we take also depends on the location we're in. So a lot of different factors in play that probably weren't there three, four years ago. And this is only accelerating. So 
we're going to need to take a look here at, at what that impact has on the employees and the productivity that they deliver. And this is what I would call the digital friction that comes along with the uh, hybrid work environment and that the digital workplace needs to solve. So two thirds of employees uh, saying that slow applications are impacting their productivity. That's no surprise for any of us. It, it happens to all of us and, that, and there's a good chance of it happening because we're all using many different apps and probably a thousand browser tabs open on Chrome. So uh, two thirds of people, employees, uh, knowledge workers using more than 11 applications a day to get their job done. The problem is on the visibility side, it hasn't really kept up the way uh, that our digital transformation is moving along, especially with people working from home and in more distributed dynamic environments, shared offices. So IT is struggling now uh, to be able to even detect these issues. A lot of them are only detected by the end user themselves. They might be short-term degradations, just in enough for you to give up and wait a little while and come back to your computer. Um, so there is a problem detecting those with traditional systems. And there's also really a problem re of resolving them. If you don't have enough information to really drill down across the whole Wi-Fi, the, com the computer performance, the cloud, what cloud am I going to? How's the SD-WAN working? How's the SASE connecting me? All those different elements, it, it's very hard to resolve it. So 40% of issues that are reported and known are never resolved. And that's actually much, much less than what really happens because a lot of problems are never detected to begin with. And we know that one in a hundred times you have an issue, you're more, you're more than willing to call tech support, but most of the time you'll try to solve it yourself without much success either. So when you have this all up, what we're seeing from the most recent statistics is that you lose about a hundred hours of lost productivity per employee annually. If you really think about it, that's like giving every employee in your team, if it's 40 hours a week, you're giving like two and a half extra weeks of vacation. That's the equivalent to the lost time. And they're not getting, they're not enjoying this vacation very much because they're the suffering. And what you'll find also is that employees will leave their jobs because of poor workplace performance in terms of digital assets. And that's about 20% of employees have left their job because of that. There's a lot of statistics behind it. And and we don't really have to go into it because we all experience it. If you're frustrated and can't get your job done, you're going to find a place where you can really shine. And that probably involves uh, changing companies. Let's take a look at what's driving that uh, pain and, and performance issues. There's two sides to it. One is really the user connectivity all the way to the cloud and, and SaaS and web applications that we're using today. And the other is how it gets there. So. There's a problem uh, if you have a lot of latency between the different hosts that are uh, delivering your application. We'll look at this in a little bit. Also, if there's processing delays that get introduced by your VPN or a SASE solution, secure service edge, that kind of proxy pop type environment. Of course, the Wi-Fi, ISP, SD-WAN, all extremely complex variables are interrelated to each other in many ways. And it's hard to isolate one from the other. So what most people do is they just blame the Wi-Fi, but most of the time, strangely, it's not that easy. So we'll take a look at what else can be done to understand that if you're a remote help desk kind of play person. Other things that actually create a lot of problems, a browser and what we call critical path renderings. How, how well is your browser performing? Uh, if you have too many tabs open or some intensive uh, windows running, in the Chrome or Edge or Firefox, Safari browser, these are taking resources and they might be delaying uh, the rendering on the screen, ability to navigate responsibly through a single page web application. There's the transfer time, which is, is more than just throughput because we have uh, packet loss and transactional issues that can create retransmissions. And that ultimately comes back to the server performance, uh, something that not always in our control. So if you think about uh, having an issue with Salesforce uh, as a cloud hosted uh, application, if there's a service for response time that's very slow, the person at home or in the office has no control over that. And even the IT team doesn't have a lot of control over that. But it certainly beats uh, trying to troubleshoot the Wi-Fi when it's got nothing to do with the digital experience. So the goal in this kind of scenario, when it's your hosting provider, your SaaS provider, your cloud provider having the problem is you need the data to have a productive conversation, create a ticket and resolve that issue quickly. You have to give them the details they need to understand what's wrong with their infrastructure. So if we look at 
uh, different ways to see into this uh, kind of semi-opaque environment. This is really the reason uh, why digital experience monitoring is now the fastest growing segment in digital observability for IT. It's because the network has changed, the applications have changed, where people work has changed. And what digital experience monitoring does is it takes a new approach to uh, application performance monitoring, real user connectivity, so seeing the whole path from the user to their apps and also a real user monitoring from the digital experience side. And it combines them together so that the entire path or the entire infrastructure from the endpoint itself all the way through to the cloud and private applications you're using is transparently uh, available to you. You can see all the insights in real time, but you can also see the individual component of each one of those. So if I was connecting from a mobile phone through uh, LTE, going through an SD-WAN and then going to ServiceNow, I'd want to know if that's actually, uh, which one of those components is a problem. And you can see how complex this can get if these applications are interconnected and also connected with your private application. So quite a complex matrix. And that's really what digital experience monitoring is designed to solve. And so today we see this as a, a main driver for enterprises that are moving into a digital workplace strategy to have the right visibility, to be able to unify that view end to end in a very simple way and be able to pinpoint where problems are. So you can see how you can understand the user experience on every single app and who's impacted, also the path that they're taking to get to that app. And that path is changing as you can see. And then how is your sd wine impacting the overall view or how is the Wi-Fi part of it? And that's the kind of uh, mysterious problems that need to be revealed. So digital experience monitoring designed to really be deployed rapidly. These are SaaS applications, automatic diagnostics. So you don't have to be uh, looking through details and correlating with a swivel chair for hours, trying to find things quickly. And the goal of it is really to create an actionable set of data. So you can triangulate rapidly, which group vendor or individual needs to solve this problem. So you're not chasing after ghosts. You're really going after the root cause immediately. And you're doing this on a way that you're optimizing and solving for the end user's digital experience, not for uh, improving network latency, but improving the digital experience of applications that depend on network latency and network loss and proactively optimize your infrastructure. So if you take a look at the top bottlenecks in your network each month, you can nail off two or three of them in minutes and you can figure out how to cause a massive benefit in productivity for a large audience, uh, whether they're uh, highly distributed accessing the same application or they're all in one site and they're having an issue with uh, general connectivity. You can identify the ones that give you the biggest payback and the best benefit to the company's uh, business advantage. Okay. So one way to get this visibility, you need to have uh, a few different perspectives. So you see on the right here, you need the ability to see from the endpoint through to the different applications you're using. That's the most fundamental. But of course, the way you get there is important. Like any journey, if you take the wrong route on Google Maps, you might take the one that says saves gas, but it might take you two hours longer. So it depends on what your goals are. But if you're in a low latency application, it's um, of course very different than your needs if you're not, right? If you're using just general data type applications. So you wanna be able to see the SaaS and web application performance in the context of the real user experience and the connectivity they have. And the ways to do this are to use synthetic network testing. So you can see directly from the user endpoint all the way through to the different applications. You can do this from Windows or Android devices, Chromebooks. That's a, a strategy that's key to be able to see the real user experience, how they're getting to those locations. And then secondly, you can also post these into your cloud and data center locations or on specific sites. So you can see if a specific site is uh, having performance issues getting to a cloud, or if the cloud can't connect to another cloud in a multi or poly cloud environment, or if your SaaS applications are connecting well to your data center through API calls. Uh, and if you want to go a little bit further and just say what regions in the world are where my employees work or my customers are accessing our applications, are there issues with just connectivity or performance in general? So you can actually test from generalized locations across the globe and understand uh, where you might want to optimize your content delivery networks or your hosting networks, or maybe you need to change the connectivity to certain office locations. That's 
the synthetic stuff where you really understand the network deeply and understand even the Wi-Fi connections and everything that people are connecting to. But to really understand whether or not the network is affecting them or not, you need to also be able to measure what they're experiencing. And this is really not something you can do effectively with a synthetic method. So putting a, a robot on your computer and testing to salesforce.com and logging in as a user and pretending to do a few clicks does not at all represent what the hundreds of Salesforce users will do across the dozens of modules and queries any form every day. So we understand very clearly at Kadiska that you have to measure that directly. You need the real user experience and that can be instrumented very easily by putting a, an extension into your browsers. Uh, as a managed extension, you can capture the data for your business applications on SaaS and web applications, private applications. You can see exactly all the transactions that are happening and what's affecting the user. We'll take a look at a couple of good examples of that with some real life data in just a second. And if you're in the DevOps side or you're working on your own private apps and you want to understand what users are experiencing, you can also put like a rum type script directly on your server as a single line of script that would allow you to see all the details from every end user and how they're getting to your application. And all that data is wonderful. It's, it's a ton of data. You don't want to look at a ton of data because you got some stuff to do during the day. You're probably more busy than looking at all the data. So the goal is to bring that into one place uh, very effectively, non-intrusively, and be able to see everything in real time, what's happening, and some guidance as to where to put your limited IT resources to get the best outcome and to resolve issues, since now you're going to be able to detect them in a very uniform way with 100% visibility. Right. So I think the best way to show you what this looks like in reality is, is a bit of a demonstration, but first I'm going to show you just a couple of results from some recent enterprise we work with in the U S what you can get with a digital experience monitoring type solution. So in this case, we're looking at the performance of different connectivity to the remote and onsite users. You can see that on the left, some of them are having some really difficult time and that's because they're using a SASE solution or CASB to access securely certain sites. And you can see there's an awful lot of waiting time here while they're, while the, the pop or the, the SASE proxy is connecting to the user's client. You can also see a few other interesting things. It's introducing hundreds of milliseconds into this a very important applications for the company, but also there's people here who are bypassing it to get to certain applications because they're just tired of waiting. You would want to wait milliseconds to get the service now when you're trying to open a ticket and get something done. So people are deciding that they're going to somehow turn off the proxy or if they can hack a way around it or use a different device just to get their job done. And this is extremely common. Other thing you can see in digital experience monitoring is things like Microsoft Teams. So in this case, we're looking at the inability for people to access Microsoft Teams. Over the period of a week, suddenly there's all these different purple uh, bars here that show they can't access Teams, but these are not total outages. These are things that are happening every couple of minutes or affecting certain people each time. So people are being dropped from calls. They have to rejoin, they have to refresh their browser. They have to restart the application. Uh, this is happening basically uh, throughout the day for a good one third of the employees. And so the question would be like, what's going on? <laughs> And in this case, uh, by doing some analysis, we, in this particular one, it turns out it's an ISP, in this case, Comcast, that has no root diversity in a specific location. It's being identified by Kadiska as a bottleneck with, with packet loss and latency issues. And this is quite amazing because you look at the full Microsoft cloud oh. network here, there's latency and problems happening, but the real origin is because of an issue with Comcast. And because you have the IP address, you can give them a call. And you can say there's something wrong. Uh, this is overloaded router and they'll be able to fix that, which they did within minutes, right? And a uh, very responsive organization with the right data can do amazing things for you. Next thing is uh, people working from home. Here's an example of Microsoft Teams again, but this time you see a huge increase in latency. So you might be tempted to think that it's something like this, but it's not. In this case, it turns out it was a Microsoft Teams server that was degrading and the network was perfectly fine. So if somebody was working from home and this was their uh, Wi-Fi connection, you might say that's the problem with this huge latency boost as a, quite a step and there's, but the thing is there's no packet loss. There's nothing going wrong with the connection at all. So in the end, it turns out it's a Microsoft team server issue. And again, if you guys actually pay them for this and you gave them that data, they'd be able to do something about it. So that's the serving site. 
<clears throat> I'm going to show you also a couple examples live. So those are good ones. Examples will be seen, but what about real life? What's happening today? So if I look at the app decks we have here showing the application performance for, for people here at Kadiska. So looking at our, our data over the last month, we can see who's impacted by which kind of applications. We can see if there's any alarms that are related to this in our system or not, and other third-party systems like ServiceNow or Datadog. Uh, what concerns me here is the Google Suite. The G Suite is not performing well at all for anybody over this period of time. And what you can see is a lot of critical experience problems. So if we were want to look at Gmail as an example, we could go uh, directly into Gmail and take a look at that. Uh, we could also go and say that we want to take a look at where those people are. So if I went to Gmail, where are the users actually uh, experiencing it and how do they access it? You can see there's a lot of processing errors over time. We can see that the processing is the significantly the dominant part that's affecting the user. So this is Gmail, it's not Google Meet. This is actually just Gmail responding where the server is taking a quarter second to get back on requests uh, from the browser to the server. And there's an awful lot of errors too. So you can see there's times where of all the transactions going between the browser and the servers is up to a 50% loss rate, which is why it's taking so long for, for this to happen. The connectivity here, the network connectivity is actually very good. So regardless of where people are coming from, so we have our different offices here and our WeWork in Paris. Even if you're working at home, it looks like it's got a red line, but it just means that's one of the, the more the more highest latencies overall, but it's still much less than 50 milliseconds. It's very responsive. So regardless of that, most people are getting to Gmail very quickly, but they're getting a lot of errors and processing problems and long delays. So you might want to say, where are those people and what's happening to them? Are they my employees on site? Are they remote? So that's where you can drill in a little bit. You can see, for example, I'm in the Montreal office. You can see uh, what that performance looks like, the ones that are nearby or places that I have taken my laptop and gone to. So you can see the processing delays across all the remote users. You can see what it looks like to be on site and you can see their connectivity is far better and there's a lot less waiting time and DNS resolution times and things like that. There's some really serious problems with some ISPs uh, in this region. So if I look at those, very different problems. This one connected to this ISP, you're waiting a lot for something to happen. That's usually a browser or a resource related problem. It could be that a user has not enough memory, for example. So we could take a look at that and we can see uh, that the users indeed are running very low on RAM a lot of the time when they're using Gmail. And that's uh, probably a function of many different plugins in Gmail things like that, but their CPU has some space. So you might want to look into that. But overall, what we understand from this viewpoint here is that the, the real issues happen to certain individuals on certain ISPs. And so if I took a look at the processing time again, and I pick, let's say, Butron, Rogers, Bell, like the ones that are a mix of different examples, let's, let's just see who that poor person is who's got that bad experience. And it turns out it's me. So. This is, is telling me that Scott is having, he's got multiple IT addresses because I've been moving around and using different, different ways to get there. So as I take trips in the region, I am going across multiple ISPs. And when I'm in like Rogers, for example, then everything is slow in my browser. So there's some connection setup problems. When I'm in Bell or Ultima, which is my home ISP, I'm really just waiting for Google, but I'm waiting for Gmail for 790 milliseconds, which is crazy. So. What that means is there's something really bizarre with my connection into that server, or they're sending me to a very poor quality server in that location. So the ones in Montreal, like Melmobili and Ultima are getting, I'm not getting directed to a very good place. Whereas if I'm in Toronto, I'm getting much better response. But you could actually look at that and say, well, what exactly is happening? If there's a connectivity issue, is it related? Very easy to do. So we'll just look at the connectivity side. And this is what it looks like if you have global offices and they're accessing applications. You can see for any particular applications, how those guys are accessing it. So if I wanted to look at a specific, let's say a target, something like Gmail, type that in as mail, it'll identify Gmail as the application. You can see there's the connectivity in Montreal, as I pointed out, is not a big problem. But if you look at other locations, there's some that are really suffering pretty badly. So if you look at Arizona, 
63 milliseconds is strange. Here we're in, in Chicago, you've got a more packet loss, and this is an average over this 31 day period, right? So you could actually flip this and say, you want to know where, how long the path is from different people, how close are they to where they're trying to connect. And Gmail has a lot of different servers, right? So what I would do here just to see what happens with the guys in what's this Phoenix? There's, yeah. So the Phoenix office, how would that look like? For them to connect into Gmail. So here's a good example of that. What it's doing here, looking over a 31 day period and saying, you know what, there's a been a big jump in latency and actually the path length changed. So the route's getting longer and there's even a distribution of latency that's just different. So what happens is you can see this is a complex path and many different paths that people take to get from Phoenix to Gmail. And these, I mean, there's many different hosts and that's what we know. If you look at this more carefully, the sort of beige color nodes here are all in the Google cloud network. So it's actually not that hard to get from the office Phoenix across their Wi-Fi and into uh, the first ISP, so liquid web, and then they'll get passed into one at level three in Colorado, then bam, they go straight into, into Google's cloud network and mountain view, which is a pretty fast route. So if I actually looked at that and looked at delay. I would see there's really no delay in these links, it's super fast. But if, but what I do notice is there's an awful lot of delay happening inside the Google cloud network, like seconds of delay. So there's some traffic loops and issues happening there between Mountain View and where you're going to, which might not be actually in Mountain View, depends on the load balancing that they call out. So if you didn't know, somebody said I'm having really not a great performance in Phoenix, what you could do is take a zone like this where you you know for sure in this point of time that something significant has changed, right? So that the different routes are being taken at different times. And then you might not want to go through all that and figure it out. So we can press on the, on the AI help here at Kadiska and it'll do that analysis for you. And it'll tell you something probably you didn't want to see. The worst targets are in Netherlands and Taiwan or in the U S doesn't make much from a DNS resolution time that's increased by 130 milliseconds and you're getting here different targets. So what's happening? Those delays we saw in the Google network before, I guess they're still there. And what's happening is they're passing you from Mountain View, California to so in totally different countries, right? And and you're getting a surprise that you went over the ocean. So you might end up in the Netherlands. You might end up in a number of different countries. We've seen this go to Japan. We've seen Bulgaria is not the most common place we've seen, but it's not exactly where you'd expect your Gmail to be hosted either. So there's some problems there. And you could certainly see that in the latency of the links. And you could talk to Google about this and say, you know what, from a data sovereignty perspective as a company in the US, you can't be hosting my Gmail in, in these different countries. Unless, for example, you're traveling to most countries, but in this case, you're not. You're actually here and everything else and the Wi-Fi is working fine. So this is an example of that. If there was a case where you thought the Wi-Fi was the issue, then we can help with that too. So what you would do here is you might want to go and see an overview of all the different, let's say, Android fleets that are actually, or your Windows machines that are out there and uh, take this over a period of time. I'll make it a little bit longer and understand is somebody's performance uh, being impacted by the Wi-Fi itself? Um, so just clean this off here and get the filters out. So you can see here uh, from different sites, the radio quality on average, and then do these things correlate with the actual application performance. So in this case, Google Media Server for G, uh, Google Meet calls, a lot of loss, not affected by the radio quality, so that doesn't correlate very well. But we do see a lot of application performance issues coming from Toulouse. And this is significantly different than the other regions of the world. So you might want to go and take a look at that, right? You might say, I want to go into the detail of how people in our Toulouse office in France are actually uh, connecting in uh, to the applications that they're using. So I'm going to just narrow down the time scale. And you can see here that from a, let's say a loss perspective, if I bring this up, there's a lot of latency and loss on this particular SSID. Rodriguez on 2.4 gigs. Now, what's interesting is if you were on the five gig network in the same location with the same SSID, you'd have virtually no latency and very little packet loss. So what we're seeing here is that the signal quality and also the, the throughput and the latency and the packet loss is directly impacted by Wi-Fi performance. 
or people who are on uh, that particular network ID node. So what you'd want to do uh, is verify with the, the users there. And actually there's one device that's having an issue. At this point in time, you would want to make sure that the device was connecting to the five gig network and you probably solve a significant number of problems for the people located in Toulouse. This is really interesting and really fast to do. So you can uh, imagine the work from home and on-site scenarios that we just covered and how you could actually really see uh, quickly uh, where problems originate from, which applications are trending up or down, where the users are and what their connectivity is directly from where they're working in a the context they are in the moment while you're looking at examining that. That's a quick summary of uh, how Kadiska does digital experience monitoring especially for digital workplace environments. Something I'd invite you to go take a look at. So on our website, we have a digital workplace ebook that we just published. And this gives you a complete guide to uh, the trend we just discussed. It goes into detail about them, but also explains a lot more depth about how to build business efficiency and also some best practices in terms of getting yourself to the point where you've got a mature approach to digital experience and you can really improve the top and bottom line and what that means to achieve right so if you want to find that on our site you can go to learn and go straight to the digital workplace link and you'll have that to download and keep on your device and share with your team okay the other thing that we're we do for our attendees of the webinar we're also happy to give you guys a, a chance to try kadiska so if you just enter in kadiska.com try you can set up an account in just a few minutes and then we'll be able to look directly with you at the digital workplace environment that you have and see if we can highlight some really easy wins for you guys to make a big difference for your employees productivity. Thank you all for joining today. I encourage you to go check out uh, the ebook and uh, send us any questions on our LinkedIn page and we'll be happy to answer those and help you guys out.